It's Big Tent Revival and living off your love. You're Envision with Matt Prater filling in for Neil Johnson on 2020. And uh, joining us on the line today uh, via Skype, we're catching up with Mark Skendret. He's uh, an amazing man of God, a lecturer at Fuller Seminary in the USA, and he's been an integral part of creating the Beatitudes program. It's from LifeWords, and it's called The Ninefold Path of Jesus. He's the founding director of Reimagine, a center for integral Christian practice. He runs retreats, workshops, and projects designed to help participants apply spiritual wisdom to everyday life. We're going to be talking about Christian spirituality, about discipleship, and we're going to be opening the phone lines in around about 15 minutes' time, so get ready to call through if you've got a question or a comment. Uh, it's a, a privilege to welcome you to Vision Radio today all across Australia, Mark. Uh, thanks for joining us, mate. So where are you based at the moment? Yeah, great to be with you, Matt. Uh, today I'm in Melbourne. Uh, we've been on a, on a, we're on a six-week tour of Australia, so we spent some time in Tasmania, some time in Adelaide and Port Augusta. We'll be heading up to Sydney in a few days and up to Newcastle after that before we head home. Oh, very cool. Well, it's great to have you out here in the great south land of the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's find out a bit of your background. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Heidelberg, Germany, but mostly raised in the Midwest of the United States in a city called Minneapolis. And um, my dad was in the military, so we moved around a lot. So I lived in Alabama, my San Francisco, Texas, but mostly Minneapolis. And did you have a religious upbringing at all? Yeah, I'm really grateful to have had um, parents who were really engaged with their faith. And I grew up in a very rich environment of my parents trying to follow the way of Jesus. And it was a real, real part of our everyday life as a family. And was there like a conversion experience for you or were you just always a follower? I would say it was kind of a two-step thing. I, uh, as a three-year-old, um, prayed the prayer because I was scared of spending forever away from God. And, um, and uh, I, uh, it actually, yeah, uh, but it was when I was 12 or 13 years old that I think the real hunger to walk with God and be and follow the Jesus way uh, kind of made sense to me, and I I really engaged with it uh, from that point onward. And tell us a bit about your early career. Like, what did you do after school? Did you study or get straight into straight into work? Yeah, you know, my ministry started when I was 13 years old. I was a children's evangelist, and I used to spend my summers traveling uh, around. Uh, my state sharing uh, the gospel with young young children and uh, through camps and clubs. And um, right after uni, uh, I worked for the organization uh, doing children's um, evangelism and discipleship before becoming a pastor. So okay, and what kind of church were you pastoring in? Uh, it was a it was a Baptist church in uh, Minnesota. And um, yeah, I had a great experience. And actually, that's part of how I got into onto the kind of ministry I do now. I remember being a young, um, people thought I was talented kind of um, preacher. And I remember feeling uh, the pain of a disconnect between what I was sharing on Sundays in my sermons and what my actual experience was um, in life. And I thought, I feel like I'm, I'm talking more about books I've read or my study than my lived experience as a follower of the way of Jesus and kind of hit a crisis point at about age 27 and thought, I, I've known what it is to be a believer in Jesus, but it feels like I'm also being called to be a follower. So how does that, what does that journey look like? And um, that took us on a path of really learning a more practical, uh, taking Jesus seriously, both as a Messiah, but also as a what he meant to be, a rabbi teacher, one who would show us and teach us the way to real flourishing in life. Well, I've just been having a look at your website, lifewords.org.au. Encourage people to check it out. Uh, and you've got uh, representation in Australia, which is wonderful. Um, for those who don't know much about LifeWords, just give us a bit of a, a background. What's it, what's, what's it all about? Uh, sure. Um, so I have a partnership with LifeWords, and um, we work together on this project called Nine Beats for the last six or seven years. Um, their uh, LifeWords' passion is um, to help make the words of Scripture come to life for people in the 21st century. And so they produce a lot of uh, really beautiful materials that um, 
that most of them are available for free that you can pick up and um, to share to share words of life with others. And I understand that there's a lot of um, practice based study uh, for churches and Bible study groups. What's that look like? Yeah. So the uh, what happened was um, back in 2015, uh, some of the Life Words folks had read a book that I wrote called "Practicing the Way of Jesus," and in that book, I I said, you know. Um, in the 21st, but the way Christianity has evolved is we tend to think that the way to be, be and make disciples is more like a college, like a college lecture hall. But in the way that Jesus made disciples, it was more like a karate studio. Like it was life on life. There were things to try on and practice. Jesus invited his disciples into adventures. And um, we, we discovered a way of gathering groups in a way that would be high trust groups where people can be really honest and authentic, talk about their struggles. And then together we'd look at the words of Jesus and say, what if we had to go at trying to follow his way? He said, sell your possessions and give to the poor. What if we got rid of half of our possessions? He said, forgive those who have hurt you. What steps could we take to let go of those resentments? And so um, my sense is, most of us know what would be good for us to do to follow the way of Jesus, but the struggle is that we need the support of others in order to take those practical steps to integrate the teachings of Jesus into everyday life. So LifeWords wanted to do a project around the Beatitudes, and they said, we think that these words of Jesus could really speak life to emerging generations. Um, they're their home offices in the UK and um, the the folks there said, you know, um, in the UK, and I don't think Australia is that much um, different. They said a lot of younger people, when they um, when they think about Christianity, they don't think they don't think it's for them, and it feels like a it's maybe something boring sitting around in in church meetings, um, and but when we look at Jesus, he was this revolutionary. He, taught, he, he pointed the way to a whole new way of being human. Love your enemies, you know, um, forgive relentlessly, um, to just li living uh, in a way of generosity, abundance, um, justice, peacemaking. And those are uh, themes that are in the Beatitudes. And so they asked me to join them in looking very carefully at the Beatitudes, studying scripture, looking for the links, and then talking with younger people about the aches that they have in their lives and seeing if we could make a connection between these ancient words and current aches that we have in our in our lives. And so we created a, a, a path through the Beatitudes we call the Ninefold Path that's a 10-session small group resource that we've seen um, thousands of people, um, their lives transformed through practical engagement with the words of Jesus. Well, mate, it sounds fantastic. And I love the way that you have simplified it uh, to the ninefold path of Jesus. Would you unpack uh, wh what's the ninefold path? Sure. So a um, couple things about the Beatitudes. Uh, um, you have nine statements of Jesus that start with the word blessed or makarios. And in the language Jesus spoke, this meant something like, wow, this person really has it going on. They are really blessed. They're really fortunate. They're almost like gods. And it's the kind of words that um, me, we might use with our favorite footy player or favorite musician. Like, they, they, life's working out for them. And so the surprise is who Jesus said was blessed, Makarios, um, the poor the the meek the mourning and so jesus is is really turning upside down our understanding of blessing and in that time if you weren't rich beautiful and powerful you were seen as cursed and so what jesus is saying there is nobody gets left out nobody gets left behind whatever your struggle whatever your story god can meet you in that but i think it's not that's not the only message of the beatitudes because it, it he could have gotten that message out there and three or four statements, there's nine. And I think he's also charting out what he's, what he's going to be talking about later in the sermon, uh, in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, giving us a vision or picture of living life with God, life in the kingdom of God that can be experienced now. And those are nine 
areas of life that the gospel invites us into a transformation journey about. Mm. I don't know if you've seen the uh, TV series, The Chosen, but I remember the scene where Jesus does the the attitudes and the the gospel, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, Matthew five, six, and seven, three of my favorite chapters of the Bible. You know, I just love uh, that picture of Jesus declaring to everyone and them going, "Wow, you know, like that teaching." It's literally changed the world, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, so um, we look at those nine statements, and um, one of the lenses that I, I worked with to develop this curriculum is that we start out with some first instincts. Our first instinct is to feel like we to feel anxious and scared, to avoid pain, to try and develop our sense of ourselves by comparing ourselves to others, to feel powerless. And Jesus meets those aches by saying, uh, blessed, blessed, are, blessed are the poor, blessed are you when you mourn, blessed are the meek, those who know their real worth as sons and daughters of God. So the Beatitudes invite us to move from maybe our first thoughts or first instincts about life into a greater awareness of God's care and presence that can transform us. Well, we are chatting with Mark Scandrett who is uh, leading a, a wonderful movement. And the website is lifewords.org.au if you want to find out more. We're talking about a practice-based study into church and Bible study groups called the Ninefold Path of Jesus. And we're talking about discipleship. We're talking about uh, the basics of following Jesus. Uh, if you want to join the conversation, maybe you've got a question or a comment for Mark. Uh, he's out in Australia, traveling around, sharing uh, a, a wonderful message. Now's the time to give us a call. If you want to call, phone lines are open, 1-800-316-316. Maybe you want to share about what your church is doing for discipleship, or maybe you've got a question about how we can disciple others. Maybe you've been discipled and you want to share how you've been discipled. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, give us a call. Phone lines are open, 1-800-316-316. It's Phil Wickham and Battle Belongs. You're on Vision with Matt Prater, filling in for Neil Johnson on 2020. And phone lines are open on 1-800-316-316. We're talking about the topic of discipleship today. We're talking about the Beatitudes. If you've got a question or a comment, maybe you want to share how you've been discipled or what you do to disciple others. Give us a call, 1-800-316-316. Our guest is Mark Scandrett. He's uh, traveling around Australia at the moment, speaking at Bible colleges and helping churches in discipleship and spiritual formation. We've been talking about the ninefold path of Jesus in the Beatitudes. Uh, Mark, tell us a little bit about how we can unpack the Beatitudes, how they apply to our lives. Yeah, one of the Beatitudes that really stands out to many people who go through our um, small group uh, material is that second one where Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. What's that about? Jesus? It's like Jesus say, is saying, happy are those who are unhappy. So our first instinct when we face difficulty in life is to want to run away from the pain, to uh, avoid pain, to numb out or distract ourselves from what's too difficult to face. And with incredible wisdom, with this beatitude, Jesus is saying to us, your healing is not going to come by running from pain. That is just going to multiply the difficulties in your life. If you have the courage to sit with what breaks your heart, that's where God's comfort can come to you. And so we often ask people in our labs, when you look at the world, what breaks your heart? What makes you feel sad? And um, so many of us are, it's, we have easy answers about that. You know, when we look at, look at um, inequality in our world and, um, uh, the rise in anxiety and mental health issues and, um, you know, so many struggles that, that, that people experience. And then we also ask the question, how, in your own life, closer to home, where is their pain, disappointment, or loss? Share about that. So we want to create a really honest environment. And um, I'm really amazed and impressed with the kind of vulnerability people share with when we are when we ask those questions and then we go, how might God want to meet us in these things? And we, um, we invite each other to take on some practices related to that. So one would be, what did people in scripture do when they experienced disappointment with, and loss? Um, it, fascinatingly, 
about a third to a half of the Psalms are Psalms of lament or complaint. So we invite people to write a letter or a poem or a song to God um, expressing that disappointment. You know, there's Psalms that say things like, God, where are you? Have you fallen asleep? There's even one Psalm, Psalm um, 88, that says, God, look away from me for just a little while so I can be happy before I die. Like there's a lot of pathos there of like, ex God's okay with it. You know, Israel means those who wrestle with God. So when we face pain, we're invited to cry out to God and express how it doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't add, add up. We also invite people to limit distractions. Um, a most of us, as, uh, as, we've, as we've grown over time, we found ways to numb out. Some popular ones right now, uh, our relationship with food or other substances, um, how we use our, our, um, our technology and devices. If we're not careful, we're, we become addicted to those dopamine hits every time we scroll on our phone or play that game. And so we invite people for a week to identify one of those places where they tend to go to avoid pain and put a limit on it to make space to take a walk, to sit with the pain and see if God's comfort might come. And then in the lab, we also invite um, one another to mourn with those who mourn. Where is their struggle and suffering uh, in, in our world right now? How could we join those who are in suffering and struggle? It might be a friend or it might be, um, it might be uh, a tragedy that's happened in a town or city near you. I know during the last few years, issues around race have really been at the front of people's minds and grieving the failures and mistakes of the past and joining with those who've been affected have been really powerful ways to, to mourn with those who mourn that we've seen in the labs. Well, it's uh, such a, uh, a wonderful uh, depth of scripture when you look through the Beatitudes. Uh, so much revelation from there. And uh, I, I love the way that you're unpacking these different Beatitudes, uh, the teachings of Jesus that really has transformed the world. Um, our guest today is Mark Scandret. He's visiting Australia and uh, has a website. You can check it out, lifewords.org.au. That's the Australian website. And uh, they're uh, unpacking, uh, you know, discipleship and spiritual formation. Uh, if you've got a question of Mark, he's with us for another 20 minutes or so. Now's the time to give us a call. Maybe you've got a question about discipleship. Maybe you want to share about how you've been discipled or what you're doing for discipleship in your church. We'd love to hear from you. Give us a call. Phone lines are open, 1-800-316-316. And you're with Matt Prater filling in for Neil Johnson on 2020. Coming up in around about 20 minutes' time, we're going to be chatting with Pastor Nathan Jones from Oasis Church in Rockhampton. Uh, they had an arson attack and their church burnt down yesterday. We're going to be hearing the latest from Pastor Nathan. Also, we're going to be hearing for uh, from uh, Dr. Paul Browning, who is from St. Paul's School in Bald Hills in Brisbane. Uh, he's uh, written a book on leadership and uh, developing a culture of trust in your organization. Listen out for Dr. Paul Browning coming up in around about uh, 30 minutes time here on Vision. But the phone lines are open 1-800-316-316. We're talking about discipleship today and small groups in particular. What do you do for small groups in your church? Do you have uh, a group that, you know, just talks about what the sermon was about on Sunday? Are you running alpha courses? Are you running marriage courses? Are you running young adults groups? What are the small groups like in your church? And what's the dynamic like in your small group? We'd love to hear from you. We do have a small group ex expert with us on the line. His name's Mark Scandrett. He's out in Australia uh, teaching in some churches uh, on discipleship and spiritual formation. And uh, if you want to check out Mark's website, lifewords.org.au, Mark is a lecturer at Fuller Seminary in the USA and uh, based in San Francisco. And he's been an integral part of creating the Beatitudes program from LifeWords called the Ninefold Path of Jesus. Uh, if you've got a question or a comment, give us a call right now, 1-800-316-316. And uh, Mark, I know that uh, you're going to be speaking at a church called The Granary at Newcastle. Great church. Uh, when are you uh, going to be there, mate? Yeah, I'll be there the second week of September and there's a public event on personality and discipleship or personality and spiritual formation uh, that will be on September 9th from 9 to uh, a.m. to 1 p.m. So we, we'd love to have more folks come along for that. It'll be great. 
Fantastic. Now, mate, uh, we've also just been having a bit, a bit of a chat off air about your role at Fuller Seminary. Uh, tell us about what that looks like. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious to know a bit about what your role is there. Yeah, I, I teach in the doctoral department and I help leaders um, learn to create really practical contexts for discipleship or spiritual formation. And um, there's both some big ideas related to that and then some like nuts and bolts things that go into that. Um, one of the questions, well, well I'll just say um, Dallas Willard was a big mentor of mine. And one of his big contributions was to talk about the present availability of a life with God and that God is making all things new and we can be transformed to be more like Christ in our lives. So one of my enduring questions is how does that happen? And a question that our community started asking is, are we experiencing the kind of transformation that's promised by the gospel? And I had to look at my own life and go, no, I don't think I am. And we started asking what, what might be some of the reasons for that? And I think typically we've thought of discipleship as individualistic, information-driven, and event-driven, and disconnected sometimes or dishonest about the real stuff we struggle with in life. Well, how did Jesus make disciples? It, um, he, he wasn't just individualistic. He invited people into, into a relational community. That's why small groups are so important. He didn't just give wisdom or teach. He invited people to take, take on his way. He gave practical instructions and said, have a go at it. And we see this in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was incredibly honest about the stuff we struggle with in our lives. So you look at the at the Sermon on the Mount, and one of the first things Jesus says is, if your brother or sister has something against you, go to them. Well, how many of us struggle in our family relationships and long for reconciliation? He goes a few more verses, and he says, don't be anxious about your life. Don't be, don't be worried. How many of us struggle with worry or anxiety? So he, he was very realistic about those things. So we try, and I'm a big advocate for creating high commitment, high trust, small groups. I think if we're not careful, small groups ending up being a time where we gather, maybe there's some, there's some food. Um, we talk about a book we've, we're reading or maybe should have read but didn't read before we showed up and then take some prayer requests. And to really grow in Christ-likeness, I think we need a little more teeth to it. And so the Ninefold Path is a small group curriculum designed to change the contract to a much more engaged participatory way of being in a small group. So when we set it up, we say, this isn't maybe going to be a little bit different from another Bible study or group you've been a part of. You need to show up at every session, be here on time, be ready to be vulnerable. And then here's the key. Take, uh, we're, we're all going to commit to do some things to try and practice the way of Jesus between now and the next time we meet. And we see people who've been ha, been Christian for a very long time. Well, the, the biggest comment we get back is they said, this has been the most meaningful and transformative experience I've been a part of. And one of those key things is setting ex the expectation that we're going to work it out together. We're going to take we're going to take some tangible steps in our lives. So each small group session, there's a journal exercise to do between now and the next meeting that helps us increase our self awareness and be honest. There's what we call a daily habit where we try on a classic spiritual discipline and see if it helps us to li live life uh, uh, better and love love God and people better. And then we have a part that's called the experiment. When you looked at these teachings of Jesus and you listen to the spirit, what's God prompting you to do to take a new risk with your life? And it's in that action where we discover how good the good news is and really learn to walk it out. And I think there's so many people of faith who we long to live like Jesus but we've, we've ended up sort of spending most of our time in the thinking and the talking part and a, not quite enough time in the action. And my sense is most of us don't have the cojones or the ovarios <laughs> to, to, to um, take those steps of discipleship by ourselves. We need the support of an accountable community 
to live out those things that we long to. And if people are interested in finding out more about LifeWords, the website is lifewords.org.au. And so there might be people listening right now that are thinking, yep, I need to start a small group. Uh, I've, yeah. I've been going to my church, attending on a Sunday, but I've never actually started a small group. What, what would your advice be to them? What's the next steps they could take? Yeah, I would suggest reading my book, Practicing the Way of Jesus, and then getting a hold of this ninefold path uh, curriculum that has these sessions charted out and it's got scripts for thing for bits to say and then some really compelling questions that get the group talking and then some suggested practices that the group can take on between sessions and um, it's a uh, I felt like I'm, I'm a mad scientist because <laughs> I spent a couple of years trying to take all the wisdom we learned about holding that small group space and putting into that ninefold path lab curriculum. And then there's also a book published by InterVarsity Press that goes along with that curriculum that I wrote called The Ninefold Path of Jesus. So they're two really good companions for each other, the lab and the book. And I'm just noticing on your website a few other books, mate. I'm curious about uh, Belonging and Becoming creating a thriving family culture. Uh, give us a, a quick snap. We haven't got much time, but give me a quick snapshot of that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, it's a book my wife and I wrote together. We had a really wonderful time raising our three kids who are now uh, headed towards 30 years old. And um, we just thought there were some principles in scripture that really um, helped activate our family. And we wanted to create an intentional creative soulful approach to family life so we share seven principles or kind of themes on how how families can do that fantastic and also another book i can see listed there uh, spending your time and money on what matters most tell us about that one yeah it's called free spending your time <laughs> and money on what matters most um and it really gets into the nuts and bolts of how to really lean into your deeper purpose um, and identify that um, look at how you're spending your time and how you're using money to bring greater alignment to life. We just did a great workshop on uh, here in Melbourne on uh, Saturday at Ringwood Church with, with a great group of folks who are really leaning into that together and buzzing about how to, how, how to align life towards God's greater purposes together. Um, and, and your time, your money, your work, all is connected to that. And I can see a couple more books there while I'm scrolling through them. Practicing the Way of Jesus, Life Together in the Kingdom of Love, and also Soul Graffiti, Making a Life in the Way of Jesus. I'm uh, seeing a bit of a theme here, mate. You're really pointing people back to Jesus, aren't you? <laughs> uh, it's, to me, it's all about Jesus. Jesus is the one who makes the way and shows us the way to, what's, to, to life. Yeah. Mm. I'm obsessed. Mm. Now, I heard... <laughs> I would I, say, uh, I would say, um, interestingly, one of the confronting things I read, came across one time was a place where Gandhi said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Yeah. So kind of is um, how do we close the gap between how we want to live and how we actually live? Yeah. And really experience that freedom and lightness that Jesus promised. And I, I just want to unpack that. We've got a few minutes left. And if people do want to call, phone lines are open, 1-800-316-316. Join the conversation. But just in the last few minutes, uh, I heard a preacher recently say that uh, the red letters of Jesus are the least preached scriptures in the pulpits of today. And yeah. it's really challenged me to think about it, you know, as a pastor as well. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think um, I think that it's re really the spirit is calling us to return to those red letters mm. and that a watching world wonders what what's different about people who identify with Jesus or are, are part of the church. And I think we've kind of lost our way. Um, Jesus was this revolutionary rabbi Messiah who, who, whose, whose words and life turned the world upside down. And I think we've sort of over time domesticated Jesus um, we've wanted to make it s simple and um, easy, easy, and he said his way is narrow, and um, and that there's there's a more radical way that we could look at Jesus, and basically, you know, throughout history, there's been people like Saint Francis of Assisi or Saint Patrick or um, 
others who have said, I'm not content being a believer in Jesus. I also want to, I also want to follow his way. And they discovered a key to real thriving in life. And I think the church is always in need of these crazy folks on the margins who are actually willing to take Jesus seriously as the, um, as the revolutionary that he intended to be, to, to learn to live in a whole new way. Mm, absolutely. Well, it's been awesome uh, hearing a bit of your story today and hearing about this uh, wonderful uh, ninefold path of Jesus uh, about uh, discipleship and spiritual formation. Uh, people to find out more, the website is lifewords.org.au. Uh, Mark Scandrett, it's been awesome having you as a guest on 2020 today, mate. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, great to be with you, Matt. All the best. 